Hi, it's me. I'm here. Welcome to Higarashi When They Cry Chapter 4 Himatsubushi. Um, it's been a week since I finished Watanagashi. It, it was a good time, and because of that, that means that it is time for more Higarashi as we return with Chapter 4. This intro is terrible. Uh, I'm told chapter four is a little shorter than the other ones. A fair bit shorter than the other chapters. So we're probably going to blitz through this real quick and then I might end up taking another week off from Higarashi. We'll see. I don't know yet. But that's all in the future and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Today we are starting this. Himatsu Bushi, for you, the final mystery. Time-killing chapter. I now entrust you with all the mysteries hidden within Higarashi when they cry. However comical it may be, if you have reached any conjecture, then you have passed. The final novel is a meager reward for you. Conjecture is impossible. You have the right to reject this story. Yeah, all right. Every time. Every time. This arc includes choices that were added in the console version. These choices result in dialogue changes and you can and can lead to bad ends. Do you want to see these choices? Oh. Make it an actual game, you say? Well, wow. How could I refuse? Skip additional choices, show only content from PC version, prompt additional choices from console version, prompt choices and highlight correct answers. Who would take that? Why would you even do this? What's the point? Just, just show only the content from the PC version if you just want to know how to get through it. This is dumb. I hope nobody has ever picked this. Not a single person. And if I find out that you did, I will judge you. Forever. Forever. Uh, we're going to have additional choices. Who is the criminal, you ask? Don't we search for them in this story? Who is the criminal, you ask? Do you even know what the criminal did? Who's the criminal? Who is the criminal who will kill me now? Midsummer, 1985. I had misread the time and ended up arriving too early. The schedule board flipped with a series of clacks. My flight to Sapporo was still a bit later on. I still had over an hour before boarding. Well... I might as well close my eyes for a bit on that bench over there, then. I came here directly from work, so maybe the fatigue from that was making me sleepy. Finding a suitable bench, I put my luggage on the seat next to me and settled down. Whew. I sighed like an old man. Who is Akasaka? I had hoped to stay young forever, but had become splendidly middle-aged. Apparently the rumor that even people in the latter half of their 20s experience a decline in their physical strength wasn't a lie. It had been mind-numbingly easy at work lately, so I rarely had any time to myself. Busy. Mind-numbingly busy at work lately. This might have been the first time I'd been able to enjoy a journey alone like this since I was a student. The reason behind this trip was to meet with an old friend. It was a bit strange to call him an old friend. In fact, it might be better to call him a bad one. After retiring a couple of years ago, he moved to Sapporo, his mother's hometown. His mother passed away soon after, and he was now peacefully enjoying his second lease on life. His name was Kuraudo Uishi. He was a former detective from the primary investigation unit at the station in Okinomiya XX Prefecture. 
to be honest, the only direct contact we ever had didn't last more than three days. After that, we exchanged New Year's cards, but never met again. So, this would be the first time meeting him in... seven years. In other words, we met seven years ago. In 1978. There was something I just had to ask, to talk to him about concerning that time. To explain that, it was impossible not to recall the incident that happened back then. That kidnapping, the details and resolutions of which were resigned to darkness. Also, it was impossible not to recall a certain mysterious girl. My name is Mamoru Akasaka. It was a year that had been strangely hot, even though it was only June. <coughs> Early summer, 1978. Mm. Goodbye, teacher. Okay, bye. Watch out for cars. And don't drop in at a friend's house along the way. Make sure you get your textbooks in order for tomorrow before you go to bed. Clatter, clatter, clatter. The lively sounds of children running towards the hallway. Hey now, didn't I tell you before? I already have one of those. I don't need any more. The unique high-pitched voice of youth. The energetic shrill of the cicadas went completely unheard by their ears. Children, returning home from school, split off one by one from their groups of friends as they went through intersections in the residential area. Even though there were several of them in a group as they left the school, as they get closer to their homes, their numbers dwindled. <laughs> Alright, thanks for stopping in, Guy Pie. That's why the fewer friends you were walking home with acted as an indicator that you were that much closer to your destination. Later! See ya! Yeah, see you tomorrow. We finally parted ways with his last fr He finally parted ways with his last friend. A van was parked at a bend in the road. The window was open, the sound of the radio leaking outside. It must have been the news or something. For that reason, the three of them were arrested for traffic violations and obstruction of justice. Due to the protests against the Hinamizawa Dam project resulting in bloodshed when... Ca Clashing with riot police last month, things have only become more violent. The police are therefore taking precautions against radical activists causing yet another scene. Incident. Pardon me. Last week, there was also a direct confrontation with Minister Inokai on the, on the steps of the Ministry of Construction. The boy's ears perked up at the mention of the name Inokai. At that moment... A man's face peeked out suddenly from the window of the van. His behavior was a little different than that of a man looking around to see if there was any incoming traffic before he opened the door of his vehicle. His eyes meeting suddenly with the unfamiliar man, the boy panicked slightly. Nightingale, okay. Skylark, okay. They've secured the two blocks around us. We're good to go. The man in the passenger seat whispered quietly. Nodding in acknowledgement, the man opened the door and stood before the boy. You. Oh my god. Are you Toshiki Inokai-kun? While asking that, the man peered at the boy's name tag. Toshiki Inokai. The name was written plainly there. Oh no. Oh, this got real sad real quick. The phone rang for a third time. If he reached out, he could easily pick up the receiver. However, he was concerned that if he picked it up before it had even finished ringing once, whoever was on the other end of the line would think him a fairly cheap person. That's why he normally never picked up the phone until the third ring. Even he thought it was a worthless habit. However... His thinking that there isn't much meaning in waiting for just three rings, wouldn't waiting for five be alright, was very much a reality. His mind filled with such trifling thoughts, 
He picked up the phone after the third ring had finished, his reverb dampened by his action. Yes? Hello? Hello? He knew that sometimes, due to a malfunction at the switchboard, calls didn't connect well. At those times, it was best to hang up and let the person on the other end call again. Thinking that, the moment he began to hang up the phone, he sensed that he was definitely connected after all. He felt the presence of the person on the other end of the line, keeping silent. Hello? There was no way they didn't hear his question. What was the meaning of this? It wasn't like he didn't know that people could use silent calls to harass others. You were not late! I've only been going for 11 minutes, kinfolks. You made it today. However, he'd never received a call like that until today. Maybe he was just lucky before, but he didn't believe that he would receive such a call on this phone. You're not late at all. There were no direct calls to or from this line. Everything had to go through an operator. Therefore, there was absolutely no way the call would be connected unless it was verified there was somebody else on the other end of the line. That's why he didn't understand how to deal with this silent call, and instead settled into confusion. I don't know who you are, but if you have nothing to say, I'm going to hang up. Please call again some other time. Intending that to be a parting line, he made to slam down the receiver. It was at that moment, the person on the other end spoke for the first time. You didn't say who you were, so I was anxious. If you're not Minister Inukai, please hang up right away. He couldn't help but be surprised by the extremely strange voice on the other end of the line. Was there a human alive who could speak with this hoarse and metallic voice? No. This was... a voice he had heard somewhere before. That was the kind of voice that was on those lowbrow documentaries that they'd used when they wanted to hide the identity of a speaker, wasn't it? The voice he was hearing over the line was exactly like that. Who... are you? As I said, that's not what I want to ask. Are you Minister Inukai? He, Inukai, hesitated to answer. Unable to discern the intent of this suspicious phone call, he had a vague feeling that something was off. He thought about hanging up the phone and asking the operator who initiated the call. However, he forced himself to restrain that urge, and for the time being, chose to state his name and listen. That's right, this is Inukai. I said my name, now you say yours. My name doesn't matter. First of all, let's begin by thinking about the situation you're in right now. Right now, you're sitting in your chair talking on the phone, yes? Then why don't you try opening the lower drawer to your right? The lowest drawer to the right of the minister's chair. There was a lock on it. Not enough to function as a safe but nevertheless, it was a drawer that contained some valuable things. That's why Inukai thought that the person wanted some of the important information contained within the drawer. Sorry, but I don't have any intention of opening that. I have no reason to follow orders from somebody who won't even give me his name. If you don't open that drawer, I'll hang up the phone. You will most likely end up regretting that. Why don't you think about opening the drawer first? Inukai didn't like following orders from this suspicious person one bit. However, he was concerned about what the man said about regretting it, so he decided to open the drawer. He took the small key he kept stowed in his wallet and unlocked the drawer. His hand stopped right before he opened it. What if there was a bomb inside, and it would explode if the drawer was opened? That delusion took hold of him. He quelled that instinct and opened it. Did you do it? The thing that's in there, do you know what it is? This is... 
What is the meaning of this? Hey! I don't think there's any need for me to explain, is there? I'll give you some time, so please think about it a little. I'll contact you again later. Now then, pardon me. Hey! Wait! Hello? Hello? All had already ended. That would not change no matter how much he yelled at it. Even still, Inukai, without realizing that, continued yelling into the receiver for a while. The drawer was still open. On top of the folders crammed into the drawer, it lay there. Toshiki Inukai. Written in plain lettering on a grade schooler's name tag. Just lying there. Enshrined there, completely out of place, as if it were cowering. This is a work of fiction. Any resemblance to actual persons or places is completely coincidental. Ah, oh, Well, that was lovely! That was a lovely little opening movie. I'm gonna have to cut it out of the YouTube video, because that's gonna get copyright striked. Well, copyright claimed. Like the chapter 3 opening was, but really nice, really good. Do you remember Yuki? This picture. This is where I first proposed to you. That brief moment before you nodded back. You probably wouldn't know just how much it seemed like an eternity to me. Yes. I would have never thought that amount of time could feel like an eternity. Compared to how long I had to wait for you to propose to me, it was... <laughs> From the moment I met you until today, compared to the time I've spent since I was born, it might only be a brief period, but... They were definitely precious, beautiful days that deserved to be called an eternity. That time continues even now. From now on. I wonder if it'll be a boy. Or maybe a girl. Either one is fine. Boy or girl. Either way, it's living proof that we love each other. If it's a boy, we'll name it after you, Mamoru. If it's a girl, we'll put the Yuki from my name in hers. Thinking about names is so fun that in the end we still haven't decided yet. There's still time to puzzle over it. Not that long of a time, actually. You see, Yuki, there's something I have to apologize for today. It's about your job. Sorry. It looks like an annoying bit of work has come up. In the worst case, I might not be able to be there for the delivery. It's fine. You have a very important job. What you do protects the way we live. Compared to you, it's nothing. Please, go ahead. When you return, I'll be waiting here with our child. Thank you. Also, I'm sorry. Please, don't apologize. If you feel guilty about it, then you can just atone. If I atone that much, no matter how much money I have, it won't be enough. <laughs> it's a joke. Now, go on. As I left the room, I bumped into an elderly man. It was Yuki's father. In other words, my father-in-law. Father? I didn't want to intrude, so I waited in the hall. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I heard. Go. Yuki is that kind of girl. No matter what happens, she doesn't want to hold you back. I've forced Yuki to give up on so many things. Put her through this during childbirth, such an important time in her life. I'm ashamed. If you really feel that way, when you're done with your work, make some time for Yuki. She'll be happier with that than you passing your work off on someone else. Thank you. I know full well you do important work. Be proud of what you do. Yuki is looking forward to your triumphant return. Yes. 
I jumped into the taxi that was waiting outside. Compared to the time when I first got here, the numbers on the fare meter had grown considerably. It seemed the modest time Yuki and I had spent together wasn't so modest from an objective point of view. Sorry to keep you waiting. Go ahead. No worries. Well then, off we go. The taxi jerked as it changed gears to accelerate, soon burying the hospital my wife was in behind a throng of buildings. If it was to end up a really troublesome ordeal, I probably wouldn't be returning for quite some time. To call a rookie like me, and on top of that, one who's off duty, it seemed that the section chief was calling for all hands on deck. The veteran upper brass gathering on an emergency basis happened occasionally. This was the first time, though, that I experienced everybody gathering together like this. Whatever was happening, there was no doubt it was going to be something novel. Right when my wife was ready to give birth. If I wanted to spend the time to curse my misfortunes, I'd be here all day. Even the verdant Jinko trees lining the street that always brightened my mood seemed to lack some of their usual luster. Eventually, the government office came into view. Briefly holding my breath, I let the feelings of tension course through my body once again. I had to remember the work I was doing was important, necessary, and difficult. I composed myself and sharpened my wit. Ready. The taxi stopped in front of the building. Kasumigaseki, Tokyo. I almost said Tioko. Chief, everyone's here. Akasaka couldn't. Could you close the blinds? The blinds were usually closed when they needed to use the projector, or if the discussion was going to contain some particularly disturbing content. The blinds closed with a satisfying sound, darkening the interior of the room. Immediately, the inside of the room was completely drained of the pleasant morning atmosphere, leaving behind only the cold illumination of the fluorescent lighting. After the supervisor ensured that everyone was present, he nodded to the section chief once again. With everybody on the edge of their seats, the chief stood solemnly and began to give his report. Approximately 48 hours ago, the Minister of Construction's grandson, who is also the son of one of his staff leaders, is believed to have been kidnapped. It is believed the Minister, in an effort to resolve matters amicably, chose not to report the situation to the police, and plans to cede to the demands imposed upon him. It seemed that approximately 48 hours earlier, the Minister of Construction's grandson, who was also the son of one of his senior staff members, was kidnapped. The reason why it was phrased that way was because the person in question didn't admit it had happened. Based on the results of surveillance conducted on the Ministry's residence, multiple suspicious phone calls from what is believed to be outside the city took place. The abducted child is said to be under treatment for some illness, but there's no trace of any hospital records or witnesses to such effect. Due to that and various other reasons, we believe without a doubt that a kidnapping has occurred. Hey, they omitted the details that brought this incident to light. If you think about it a bit, that meant that before this incident happened, the minister's residence had been under surveillance already. I won't use the words spied upon. Of course, there wouldn't have been court approval for this, and it would have been very hard to explain to ordinary citizens. However, it was quite an effective method to catch wind of incidents like this before they got worse. I'd like for you to understand that dealing with these cases before they become a problem is the job of the Public Safety Division. Why is he just following their demands instead of reporting this to the police? The fact that a minister can't even trust the police, what is the world coming to? It seems the group of perpetrators demonstrated that they have quite a high level of surveillance on the minister themselves when they conducted the kidnappings. Enough to give the minister pause before calling the police. We'll find out right away if you call the cops, more or less. 
so it's possible that there's a mole close to the minister. Several of the high-ranking members who seem to have experienced with this kind of thing let out deep sighs. The goals of the perpetrators, their demands, as well as this entire incident, are as of yet unclear. But in any case, the possibility that this may grow to threaten national interest is extremely high. If their goal was to simply have their demands met for monetary gain, that would have been nice. However, if this was some politically motivated shakeup, things would get a lot more complicated. Since we're not receiving any cooperation from the victim, that means that we're not privy to any of the details of the threats or demands. Wait? <laughs> what are you confused by, Guy Pie? Oh, this is back in the past, I think. I think it's 1978 right now, whereas the last story I was reading took place in 1985. Uh... Due to the fact we believe there may be a mole involved in this incident, this investigation is highly classified. Only the people in this room are to know of this. Furthermore, as this case is our utmost priority, we'll be placing a hold on everybody's normal duties. Understood? After that, the supervisor continued on, tactfully explaining our course of action. If this incident were to become public, it was possible that the minister's political life would be over. I'll spare you the explanation of how the rest of the dominoes would fall, but in the end, support in the diet would decline. Followed by a no-confidence vote and a snap election, and it might even expand communist influences. In other words, we wanted to handle this delicately. Kawasaki and Saiki Monitor communications from the minister in the child's residences 24-7. Find out what the minister is doing. Report anything that happens. The remaining members, investigate whatever is related to the case as assigned to your units. Focus your line of investigation on the commies, reds, and confeds. Don't discount the possibility of foreign involvement, either. I've experienced one or two unamicable situations before. This, however, was the first time I've seen things get so hectic. Several sophisticated conversations were progressing without the involvement of a rookie like me. I didn't intend to be timid, but I couldn't hide my confusion at this unfamiliar situation. And cover that. As for Akasaka-kun, I snapped back to alertness upon hearing my name called. Y yes uh, sort of, yeah. Uh, we are watching from the perspective of this guy named Akasaka, who has a who established that he met Uishi for the first time in 1978, and then we time jumped back to 1978 when they first first met. You investigate the environmental groups that have petitioned the minister. Among them, there's that group protesting the Hanamizawa Dam project that made the papers. Make sure you investigate them thoroughly. I doubt this is the act of some citizen group, but we have to eliminate every possibility we can. Not necessarily Uishi's past. This this is Akasaka's past, and he knows Uishi. But we're not going to see a bunch of stuff from Uishi's perspective. Understood. So those opposed to the Hanamizawa Dam... It's probably best if you go to the location personally. Get some information from the local authorities. They're a fairly radical organization, so the public safety division there should have should have them marked as well. Understood. I'll head over there. Your wife. She's almost ready to give birth, isn't she? I apologize for the timing of all this, but I'm counting on your cooperation. We can't take our time with this, so we just have to brute force it with our boots to the ground. Yeah. I know. My wife hates to interfere with my work with her own circumstances anyway. Sorry, and thanks. So then, as for Kawasaki-kun and Saeki-kun, to help support your... I didn't want to take a business trip with my wife when my wife was about to give birth. Even if I was a little busy, as long as I was in Tokyo, I could head to the hospital right away. On assignment, though, 
That would be difficult. Even so, I knew the work I was doing was important, and fully understood that I was in no position to be so selfish. I'd have to make it up to my wife for something... Wow. I'd have to make it up to my wife for having to be away at such an important time. I I don't know what happened there. I All the letters mixed together. I lost that sentence. My wife, Yuki, would probably forgive me with a smile. The only thing she could hate doing would be holding me back. My male ego, though, at least wished she would have tried to stop me. Sorry, Yuki. I don't mind if you always complain to our child that their father couldn't come to the hospital when they were born because he was too busy to work with. Because he was too busy with work. The next day, I took the bullet train to Nagoya and from there transferred to the train to XX Prefecture. Getting to my destination by land took several hours. If I was traveling by air, in that amount of time I could probably get as far as Hong Kong. XX Prefecture was by no means close. I never sat in first class except for work, but whenever I did, the seats seemed stiff. Closing my eyes, I mentally reviewed the documents I read yesterday. The group under investigation, the Onigafuchi Guardians. They were a group of residents opposed to the development proposed under the Hanamizawa Dam project. The local protests were quite heated, and were getting more radicalized. Even limited to what was written in the newspapers, there was bloodshed that occurred during a clash with riot police, interference with the dam construction. Too many to count. The number of petitions, sit-ins, and direct appeals to the relevant organizations were innumerable. As an extension of that, there was a direct appeal to the Ministry of Construction the other day. This was the reason why we were investigating this group in the first place. The land that they lived on was going to be submerged, so it was no wonder they would go into a frenzy over it. Even given that, though, could they really be capable of doing something like kidnapping the Minister of Construction's grandson in order to halt the project? From my take on it, I had, I had serious doubts. Oh, sir. Sir, you do not know Hinamizawa, my friend. I'm sorry you're getting pulled into this. I'm sorry you're the mook that had to had to research this. This kidnapping plot was extremely sophisticated and complicated enough that it was believed there was some political backing. This wasn't something that could be pulled off by some group of local protesters. Well, just like the chief said, the plan was to eliminate all possibilities. While I'm in the XX Police's reference room taking my time investigating, the higher-ups in Tokyo would probably solve the case. Without my involvement entirely. Even if that was true, I couldn't regret being away from Tokyo while my wife was ready to give birth. This was work. There was really nothing that I could do. Ding dong! The announcement that we would be arriving at our destination soon snapped me back to wakefulness. Kogura XX Prefecture, Prefectural Public Safety Division. The Onigafuchi Guardians? Yeah, they've been quite active around here. The Prefectural Public Safety Department already had the document and a cup of tea ready and waiting for me. The short of it is there are a group of residents opposed to the dam. Really, it's probably better to say that every resident living on the land that's going to be submerged is rising to action, though. Like the old saying, fight to the last, they're a determined and well-prepared lot. It'd be nice if they drew the line at just being a moderate residential organization. The stack of papers they had prepared for me in the document room was by no means thin. At first, they were pretty much your average citizen's initiative, but... Ever since that incident with the riot police, they've really started to heat up. Now they've got a violent mentality, on top of growing increasingly radical. 
Violent organizations usually indicate ones that enforce their own ideology without regards to the democratic process. Breaking that down, many of those organizations held extreme left revolutionary ideologies. Considering that, I couldn't help but be surprised that a citizens group would end up going this far. Radical citizens movements happen occasionally. It seemed, however, that this group was nothing as trifling as that. It seemed that I would have to reconsider exactly what this Onigafuchi Guardians was. The Guardians demand, in other words, the withdrawal of the dam project. How far would they go to have that demand met? The kidnapping of the minister's grandson was classified. That meant, of course, I couldn't tell the XX Prefectural Department about it either. As you know, there were arrests after last week's confrontation with Minister Inukai. There's enough reason to believe they could use illegal means to assert their demands. I skimmed over the list of the criminal records related to the Onigafuchi Guardians recorded in the documents. The contents were all violent, not giving me the barest hint of a feeling that these people were trying to uphold the law. Could you give me a basic rundown of the types of illegal activities the Onigafuchi Guardians are engaging in? The chief opened up a manila envelope, fished out several unorganized sheets, and spread them out on the desk. It seems that raids on the construction site are the most common. At first, they were committing relatively petty crimes like cutting power cords, jamming locks, and breaking office windows by throwing rocks. Of course, what really happened first were things like demonstrations, sit-ins, and distribution of pamphlets. Lively, but democratic forms of protests. However, then the demonstrators and police clashed, which started a riot, leading to numerous injuries and arrests. It was from then on that the Onigafuchi Guardians, like their name implies, began to take a more demonic form of resistance. If the raids were frequent, didn't the local police up their patrols? Well, of course they were on full alert, but they were up against locals, you know? There wasn't much the police could do if they were sneaking around under, under the cover of darkness. You might as well label the entire map of Hinamizawa Village around the damn construction site enemy territory. No matter how alert the police were, the locals would just show them exactly how easy it was to sneak around. Actually, it was after the police upped security that the protesters started getting even ever more extreme, as though they were being provoked. See here? Can you tell how things started to heat up? An office set on fire. The destruction of heavy construction equipment. Destruction? They couldn't have used explosives? No way. You see, they crammed the gas tanks full of sugar cubes. If they do that, it fouls the engines. Even in Japan, it seemed that there had been people doing that to the vehicles of occupying forces right after the war. Compared to misdemeanors like breaking windows, it was extremely violent and aggressive. After being toyed around with to that extent, the local police have completely lost face. The arson was a bit much. After that, the local police drastically increased the number of personnel they had stationed there around the clock. The raids on the construction site quieted down a bit after that. He used the words quieted down, but that was still smack dab in the middle of the list of crimes. See, after that, they... After they found that attacking the site had become difficult, they started resorting to personal attacks. The first people targeted were the construction workers. After that, there was silence. What was being described to me was a guerrilla war fought in the jungle. Threats and violence against the workers. Harsh words and harsher rocks were thrown. There's quite a list of accusations here, but there's not a whole lot of convictions. Of course not. First of all, there's no witnesses. On top of that, even if we identify the perpetrators, they have alibis coming out of the woodwork. Hmm? What do you mean by that? Hmm. Take, for example, you're walking around Hinamizawa when a certain man stabs you with a knife. 
You remember the person clearly, and even know his name and address. However, the knife doesn't have any fingerprints on it, and there's no other physical evidence. Well, you'd think this would be a run-of-the-mill case of assault, wouldn't you? In Hanamizawa, though, it's a perfect crime. Everybody is... The entire village. They're all in on it. To protect the man who is the perpetrator, they'll get their stories straight and prepare an alibi. To that end, they'll probably even forge some evidence. There's nothing they can do but put them on trial. On top of that, not being any material evidence... On top of there not being any material evidence, though, people testify one after another to cover his side of the story. Any prosecutor was, would hesitate to file charges. I'm not sure about murder, but if something like opening a gash on somebody's forehead with a thrown rock, or leaving a bruise after hitting someone, even if you could single out the suspect, there's enough reasonable doubt to not convict. Every case is without a doubt perpetrated by someone in Hinamizawa, but they can't identify who. Even if they could figure out who it is, they're unable to obtain enough circumstantial evidence through due process. The villagers were all extremely well informed about this, and so the malicious, vicious, and tenacious personal attacks continued. The victims can't have been okay with that, right? Couldn't they have filed for an appeal? Well, you see, about that... Everybody on the inquest committee didn't want to get involved with something so troublesome. They won't stick their noses into anything related to Hanamizawa. The inquest committee is comprised of a random selection of local residents. In the event the prosecutor fails to get a conviction, they have the power to order a retrial. Um, right now, they're threatening to kill the child of one of the people who are trying to flood their city village flood their village or rather they have him kidnapped we don't know if he's gonna die yet it's a system designed to assert the assert the will of the people on the actions of expert prox prosecutors in the legal world in this case however being composed of local residents has backfired they don't want to get involved why is that hmm how do I explain this? You could say they're afraid. Since it's a little special there. Special? Is it an outcast community? Yeah, so... The big thing that has been talked about in the game is the Hinamizawa Dam Project. Where the country of Japan was going to insert a dam somewhere to create water create a dam as you do with dams <laughs> and this dam was going to result in the flooding of several little villages thousands of people were going to lose their homes and Amizawa desperately and horrifically defended against the dam and stopped it from happening we are currently in the dead center of this conflict over the dam Though, it's a little different from that. Well, just think of it as them being afraid. It's a little hard to explain it just now. Oh, right. There's an easier way. Wiping his forehead with a handkerchief, he opened a, lab a file labeled as a list of members of the Onigafuchi Guardians. The power of the Onigafuchi Guardians, you see is the fact that they count many people among their members who are influential in neighboring areas. Could you take a look at this? Not quite. Let's try and avoid that kind of language. <laughs> they, they are radical protesters. As of this moment, nobody has died yet. But they have, have done some slight personal attacks on key people. Uh, could you take a look at this? I looked. What I saw startled me. 
prefectural and municipal assembly members, staff members of the Chamber of Commerce, an executive of a biz business association. An executive of a town council association and a PTA liaison. There were more than a few people with a lot of say both locally and in the neighboring regions. Around here, you could pretty much expect your actions to be observed by those against the dam project. If you said something in its support, who knows how it'd work out to your disadvantage. In any case, Every town in this area is being held by the throat by somebody from Hinamizawa. The list of Inquisition Committee members is undisclosed, isn't it? There has to be some measures in place to make sure they avoid retribution, no? Well, it is undisclosed, so their privacy is assured, but... The person in charge of that is from the Okinomiya Municipal, Poli Municipal Office. In other words, a local. While you might expect some professional confidentiality, you can't know how everybody is connected. The people from Hinamizawa have a lot of tight bonds in that regard. When you consider the obligations and duties people have to the region, the web of information thereby formed is nothing to scoff at. It's not uncommon for housewives in, in a neighborhood to know which kid from which house is what grade and which school, what subjects they're good at, and what vegetables they hate, among other things. You see, there's a Yakuza organization here with strong ties to Hinamizawa and the surrounding area. It would seem that they're providing full support in these recent incidents. They seem to be proving most effective. Gangsters? Siding together with the residents opposed to the construction of the dam? It's a little hard to see what their common interest is. It's not that difficult at all. You see, actually, one of the lieutenants in that gang, gang is originally from Hinamizawa. He was adopted into a rather influential family in the village. Exactly what was this Hinamizawa? I had thought it was some desolate, rustic this village. However, for some reason, they, exert, they exerted a strong influence on the surrounding areas and had a strong sense of unity. They would protect their village by any means necessary, even if that meant resorting to violence. The chief, has said, the chief had said that they were afraid because there were numerous influential people living there, but somehow, I got the feeling that they were afraid of the village itself. There was something clearly different from what I had read in the documents in Tokyo. This was no simple residential protest against the dam. For some reason, an uneasy feeling began to nestle itself at the back of my mind. I chose the most basic way to ask my question. In other words, I directly asked what I wanted to know. Well, a stutter. Chief, this is just a hypothetical situation, but... Huh? This... Onigafuchi Guardians... In order to halt the dam project... Do you think they could, say threaten somebody important to accomplish that? The chief replied immediately. It's possible. Truth be told, they've already gone to municipal and prefectural offices, as well as local offices of the Ministry of Construction, and done things that could be construed as intimidation. Several of the workers' families have also reported that they're being followed around by some suspicious people. Well, that would make sense. To halt progress on the dam, they raided the construction site, destroying heavy machinery and lighting the construction office on fire. If they didn't have any qualms about doing that, threats and violence against people related to the dam would probably be no problem. But that was it. Even your everyday hoodlum could use threats and violence. However, this time it was the kidnapping of the minister's grandson, an abnormally high-level crime. Not only was pulling off the kidnapping difficult in the first place, but so was maneuvering to have the ministers surrender to their demands immediately. There was no way this was the work of amateurs. <laughs> Arson! Heck yeah! Did these people have the power to enact this large of a crime? This was the heart of the matter. Was the Onigafuchi Guardians an organization capable of pulling this off? 
In order to ask that question, once again, I chose the most basic method. Again, hypothetically, do you think they could kidnap a relative of someone of political importance? There was no way they could pull off something that big. That was the answer I most hoped for. If it was that answer, my work was as good as halfway done. I might be able to get back in time for my wife to give birth. That was how it was supposed to be. The chief, without a hint of hesitation, replied, They just might. There's no telling how far they'd go. Sorry, Yuki. It seemed like my work wouldn't end so simply after all. Oh, Akasaka-kun. Good work. How's the information gathering at your assigned region? It's coming along. It seems I'll be able to meet with their local public safety department, so I'm planning on heading out that way. How's the investigation in Tokyo going? The others are progressing along, but the number of groups we have to investigate are countless. Time isn't really a luxury here. There was no new developments at this time. No matter how suspicious the Onigafuchi Guardians was... If they solved the case in Tokyo, my job was done. It looked like my wishful thinking wouldn't come to pass. Hanging up the phone, I let my gaze drift outside the window to the valley of unfamiliar buildings. Akasaka-san, a car you can borrow just returned. I'll take you to it, so follow me. Ah, thank you. He showed me the elevator to the underground parking lot where a battered sedan was waiting for me. That the steering wheel kept drifting to the left was a little concerning, but it would be enough to get me around for a while. My destination was Shishiboni City, XX Prefecture, an area under the control of the Onigafuchi Guardians. The Okinomiya Police Station was right on the front lines. Ooh. Is that the end of the chapter? We're like an hour in. Nope, not quite. Not quite.